Hello everyone, welcome back to our Natural Pet Care Summit. We're in the final stretch. We got one more this afternoon. We so appreciate you being with us all weekend. And I am really happy to have a good friend on. Um, if, if it wasn't for COVID and if we didn't live an hour apart, I'm pretty sure Michelle and I could get in a lot of trouble together. <laughs> but, <laughs> Michelle and Jeff Allen are lifelong animal advocates. Mich Michelle is the co-founder and director of Monkey's House, a dog hospice and sanctuary. They have a small farm in Burlington County, New Jersey that has been home to many foster and rescue animals through the years. Identifying a real need for help for homeless dogs in shelters needing hospice placement, the Allens got to work trying to find a better more efficient way to help. After the loss of their beloved dog monkey, they went into high gear, turning their home into a dog hospice and sanctuary. And Michelle was recognized as a CNN hero in 2017 for their work at Monkey's House. Hey, Michelle, really glad you're joining us. Thank you so much for having us. So uh, first of all, we just have to point out that behind Michelle, there are just Beautiful pictures. Uh, are, do you have a professional photographer or is that one of your volunteers that does those? Where do all those photos come from? This one here. This Champ, Champ was a professional photographer. The rest are my cell phone and um, the, the canvas places have sales like Black Friday sales where they're $1.99. So I pick my pictures that come out the very best and I have them all cropped and ready to go so that when they have their sale, they get upset that they reminded me that they have a sale. Um, but it's, it's the best way to tell a story about living well in the face of illness. You know, yes. I can sit and talk all I want, but if I can show you, that's even a better way. It is. So for those who are not familiar with Monkey's House, which you guys have, I don't know, 70,000 Facebook followers-ish? Give or take, yep. Give or take, it's a lot. Um, and uh, people people go to your Facebook page because one, they wanna uh, learn about hospice care, but also because they uh, get really attached to these dogs and you tell their story through the pictures and their adventures. Um, but for those who are not familiar with Monkey's House, uh, tell us a little bit how a dog finds its way to Monkey's House. Um, dogs show up at shelters and usually they're a hot mess. But even then to be a hot mess, they have to be a really hot mess. Um, you and I used to joke that if they weren't sick enough, you'd make me send them back. Luckily- <laughs> I don't think luckily, we ever did, but- <laughs> luckily, luckily you never made, you never held, held still on that one. But the dogs have to have multiple comorbidities. Usually um, their owner dies or the family has not done anything to address the illnesses of the dogs and they just get sicker and sicker and to the point where they just decide to dispose of them in the shelter. And that betrayal is pretty awful to, to be that sick um, or to be grieving over the loss of your, of your person. It's, it's just a betrayal. And so, uh, you know, I go back and forth with the shelter and I never ask them how special they are or how cute they are or how exceptional they are. And yet I can talk to you about 108 dogs and about how exceptional every single one of them is or was. Um, what they are is also very, very sick. Heart issues, lung issues, cancer, seizures, tumors, brain tumors, we take it all. And those are the questions we ask. What, what is the heart murmur? Are they passing out? Are they having seizures? Are they staring at the wall? You know, how do, how do you know that they're blind? Um, generally, they, the amount of dogs that come to us that are blind or blind and deaf is alarming. It's, it's alarming the things that are happening to our pets who are the canary in the well, really. Yeah, and I, I, you know, it's, it's sad and I, I think our, um, Oh, I think our economic climate at times plays into it. Uh, when people lose their jobs or lose their homes, have to move, can't take their pets with them. Sometimes they have to make very difficult decisions. And um, I, it's we have to be very careful not to get angry at that dog being dropped off. 
because we don't know the circumstances behind it. It could be that they just said, yeah, I'm done doing this. I'm not spending money on this animal. But, you know, sometimes there are circumstances that we don't understand or know about and we're not privy to. So uh, in, in rescue work, it becomes difficult not to become jaded and not to start to hate people, uh, but we don't know the circumstances behind them. But I can say that the dogs coming into Monkey's house, because uh, you, you were lucky enough to find a younger veterinarian closer to home that, <laughs> that is available. But at the, for the first few years, every dog that came into Monkey's house came to my clinic, and I had the privilege of working with every one of them. And uh, it, it truly was amazing how many of them had diseases that had they been treated or dealt with, they would not have been in such dire situations. Um, for instance, was it Phoebe, Fifi? That was the- Fifi. 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 Give, us, give us Fifi's quick rundown. She was, that was a, a tragic story with well, a good it's ending. Funny. It's funny <laughs> You would say to me, where did this one come from? Where did that one come from? And I'd say this shelter and I arranged for transport. Fifi um, was dropped off at my house and you said the shelter delivers now? And yes, the shelter <laughs> delivers because she, they didn't think she would be alive by the end of the day. And Fifi came, um, she was a white little like poodle Bichon mix and she was covered, the top half of her was in blood and the bottom half of her was in urine. And she was not really conscious. And I went to just give her a quick bath to clean her up and she very quickly turned white. And I'm not a groomer. So to me, this was all fresh, this was all acute. So I, I got on the phone with you and I said, she needs to come today. And it was, it was a Wednesday, it was like December 15th. It was a dark, dreary day. We were in Pennsville. It was a long drive on the turnpike. I just remember holding her on my chest of all things um, because I was pretty sure she was dying. And, you know, you looked at her and you said, you know, she's a mess. And um, it turned out she was a diabetic and she was in diabetic ketoacidosis. She had horrible dental disease, which had allowed blood to infection to enter her bloodstream. She was dehydrated, she was stressed, and she was grieving over the loss of an owner. And um, you were kind enough to lend me your IV pole, your IV pump. We turned, we turned my bathroom into a mini ICU where she got round the clock care, insulin, antibiotics, fluids. And in just a few days, we turned her around into an incredible little, little happy girl. But what was funny, just coming off of your interview with Dr. Broadfoot was um, Fifi had a limp and she, she knuckled, she, she walked on the top of one of her back legs and we assumed it was diabetic neuropathy. And you were coming out with the, New Zealand, with the New Zealand deer velvet and you sent me home with a bunch of them and you said, try them, try them on everybody. Let me know what you think. Well, Fifi's foot turned up right and she started to run and she started to jump on everything. And you said, what'd you do? And I said, I don't know what I did, what'd you do? Um, <laughs> but it was just one of those things that it just, it was, it was, really, it was really miraculous, the quality that it gave her. Yeah. And how long did Fifi hang out at Monkey's house? Fifi was with us for about two and a half years and she was a brittle diabetic, which meant that she'd be fine one minute and her blood sugar would be 15 the next. So everywhere I went, I had syrup or molasses with me and her with me. Uh, and I got used to massaging her gums while I was doing other things <laughs> and, you know, was, was very blessed. Um, in the end, we lost her to um, cancer in her bowel. And uh, that stinks, but in between all of that, you know, between the start, you know, when they say there was so much love, there really was. And she was, she was beautiful. And you had sent some clothes over. She, she was like a fashionista. <laughs> and she and um, another little dog, Buck, we, we joked that they were the Barbie and Ken of monkeys. <laughs> well, and see, that is um, a true testament to good hospice care. That was a dog that was really not expected to live an hour. And she managed to grace everyone with her presence at Monkey's House for two and a half years. Um, so that brings up the question, how do shelter veterinarians determine who lives and who dies? That's a good question and a question that I don't have an answer to. I can tell you that when I pull the dogs off of 
the information that I've been given, sometimes I wonder that they don't even see the vet, that they see maybe a tech, because um, they'll have a grade 10 heart murmur, <laughs> or, they'll have a, or they'll have a lethal heart murmur. Uh, things, things that don't make sense to me, but I assume maybe in veterinary terms, they make sense. And then I find out there are no veterinary <laughs> terms. Uh, um, you know, so, so I don't know. I, I know that shelter medicine is doing the best you can and, and taking your resources as far as they'll go. And, um, you know, under that, there's no, there's, there's, there's not money for blood work, for senior panels, for EKGs, for echoes, for x-rays to see how bad things are, unless, um, unless there's a group behind there trying to fund that stuff. So um, a lot of it is a good guess on my part. And it's, it's easy to find the ones that are a hot mess because they're just such a hot mess. Um, there's, there's plenty, there's, there's plenty there. There's plenty. Uh, who, uh, I'm, I'm not gonna come up with his name, the pit bull with kidney failure. Parker. 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 So give us the lowdown on Parker. Because he was another, he was a heartbreaker. Everybody loved him. He was. I, I wish I had that picture on me. He, he gave you a kiss one day that like started here and went like <laughs> up your nose and up your eyelid and up your hair like this. But that was kind of how he kissed. He was, he was a beautiful, he was a beautiful pit bull, but he was emaciated. And he um, was taken by, he was down by the road and he was taken by the animal control officer to a local no-kill shelter. And they did blood work and the veterinarian recommended humane euthanasia because of his advanced kidney failure. And he truly was stage four kidney mm. failure. Um, and the, I'm friends with the people at the shelter. They called me up and they said, you know, could, could you take him? And I said, I really don't have space. He's gonna be in my bathroom for a little while. And they said, that's okay. <laughs> so, so I take one look at him and I move things around. I thought, I'm not gonna have him die in my bathroom. He needs sunlight. And I moved everybody around. And so we put him in what we call the healing room, which is the cottage with the room with all the, the windows on both sides. Started giving him fluids. Um, he was, it was an incredible learning experience for me because you and I were able to go through the stages of kidney failure together and understand nutritionally what he needed because he was, he was 40 pounds, 35 pounds was his head. And the rest was a rack of bones, just a rack of bones. And, you know, initially his, his kidneys were bad, but we were able to put on a little bit of weight, put on a little bit of muscle. And then there came a time where really he needed to get his, his calories from carbs. And then eventually it was, he really needed to get his, his calories from fats. And it, it was just walking through the stages, um, working with phosphorus binders. Um, he would get so much fluids. And I tried very much, you know, when you're hooked up, when you're, when you're, when you're getting 750 cc's of fluids twice a day, I'm trying to make that part of his lifestyle. So I would hang the bag from my car window um, or from a tree branch so that I could, so he could lay outside so that he wasn't always in the sofa being, Getting, getting fluids, I tried to make it more of a lifestyle. Um, and it was also a good talk for you and I, um, because as he was coming near the end, he was with us for nine months, nine incredible months. Again, supposed would, to live like three days. Yeah, and really the paperwork looked like he was gonna live. It, it, was, it was believable. Like, like yeah. I would say for the, first, for the first two weeks, every night I kissed him goodnight. I, I really kissed him goodnight. I really, I really said goodbye every night. And, um, but he lived, he lived so vibrantly and he was such a good ambassador for, for pits. I mean, you know, like I said, he, he loved everybody. He kissed, he loved people. He loved bully sticks. He loved belly rubs and he loved laying in the sun and everything else was just extra. Um, everything else was just extra. But when he was nearing the end, I remember saying to you, what does this look like? How, you know, you know we were talking about, um, you know, making sure he didn't, we didn't lose him in the middle of bad seizures or anything. And we were talking about what to look for. And it, it was one of those things where I felt, I remember I was crying and I asked you to please keep talking, to please, please help educate me as to what to look for. And I appreciated our closeness. Um, you know, yes, yes, you're, you're a part of Monkey's House. Yes, it's your job, but you're my friend. And I keep telling people, if you're not friends with your vet, you need another vet. You need someone that can, that can help you through and, and 
you know, keep working with that. And it's, it's comforting to know you can do this or you can do that. When we get to this point, we need to worry about, you know, his, his aluminum levels or, you know what I mean? We need to just worry about different things. Um, so, you know, I wanted to push the envelope as far as I could, but I didn't want him to have to, to suffer for it. And we did actually end up putting him to sleep um, in the sunshine. It was like January, it was zero degrees out. And I, <laughs> um, the, the vets came to the house and I put a bed outside and I put heat packs on it. And I had him laying on the heat packs. And I said, he just wants to feel the sun for a minute. I mean, truly I'm a crazy person about that stuff, but it was very gentle and very peaceful. Well, and I think, you know, for anyone who is interested in, um, doing foster care or having any kind of hospice care set up. Uh, I, I know a lot of people, this uh, kind of breaks their hearts and they say, wow, you know, I too would like to be able to be, a, you know, a foster home or a hospice caretaker for um, one or more uh, animals, whether it's dog or cat from a shelter. Um, but hospice care is, is not just bringing them to your house and watching them die. There is a lot that goes into it. And we are very lucky in that hospice care is a rapidly growing field of veterinary medicine. And particularly a lot of the holistic veterinarians, um, there's a lot of house call hospice care available. Uh, but frankly, uh, being able to do a lot of the care yourself has made a huge difference because if every time a dog needed fluids, you had to drag them into a veterinary office or drag a veterinarian out to monkey's house, um, it would become an untenable situation, especially with the, you know, normally 25 or so dogs at your house. Um, you are a nurse, so that helps. Um, but would you say for the average pet owner, and I know what my answer is to this, but would you say for the average pet owner, if they really had the desire they could learn how to do insulin injections, sub-Q fluids, uh, check blood sugars, um, whatever, you know, a lot of the, the kinds of things that you're doing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's very empowering. You don't have to feel like such a victim that your dog is dying and there's nothing you can do. You can travel the journey with them. Um, you can say, hey, guess what? Their blood sugar is 20 and they're not really conscious. You know, I just started um, some Caro syrup instead of racing them to an emergency room and probably losing them without you there, I, I, you know, you can get a hold of your veterinarian, skip insulin that night and reformulate your plan the next day and travel that road much closer. It's, it's a matter of becoming educated, becoming comfortable. I, I think just about everything I've done, I don't think, I don't think I had any diabetic training with you. I think I asked what sites could I inject for insulin um, and where could I get blood? Um, you know what I mean? Like, I think I asked some, some questions about sites, but the principles are the same. And once you've done it a few times, it's not hard. And once you can do it on your sofa and not upset your dog, it becomes part of their life, part of the routine, and it doesn't detract from their quality at all. Exactly. Uh, there's so much that can be done. Unfortunately, I feel like in traditional medicine, um, very often the doctors are pretty quick to encourage the owner to give up pretty quick to say, you know, like Parker, Oh, his kidney enzymes are terrible. He's going to die soon. We should just end it now. Um, or wow, we found this bleeding tumor in the abdomen. The dog's got, um, uh, she's probably watching Sweta Desai from, uh, Ohio was given that determination on one of her dogs came as a complete shock to her. And the veterinarians at Ohio state said, well, you should just put the dog down today. It's not, it doesn't have long to live. And when you get shocking news and you haven't even had time to process that, and then you're, that is followed immediately by, well, let's just put them down now. Um, I would, highly recommend taking a step back and saying, well, I got to process that first. Let me, let's let this sink in. Let me do a little research. Let me talk to some people. Let me figure out, uh, you know, um, and, uh, and then kind of like we did with Myra, um, be able to spend that time and decide how you want to approach it. Um, so 
because you were getting you know, the Fifi's and the Parker's and these dogs that were so incredibly sick. And so many of them decided, hey, I really like it here. I'm going to hang out for two, three years. <laughs> so then we had this worry of, oh my gosh, you're going to be overrun. And then what do you do? Um, but th there seems to be a, just a, a, an ebb and a flow that it works very well. Um, I totally lost my train of thought. They were living longer than we expected. That that terminal diagnosis oh, was I know. not. So diagnosis. what happened is you and I actually had to come up with guidelines for Monkey's House. And we said, well, how do we determine when euthanasia needs to occur versus when can natural death occur? And natural death is something that many, many people are not comfortable with, with their pets. We kind of are with people because we don't have choices, uh, but with our pets, it's kind of like, it's, uh, it seems to be more black and white. It's like, well, you know, they get bad, you just euthanize them. Well, how do you determine what is bad? And so we kind of came up, we had to come up with guidelines to decide because you were the one living with the dogs every day, but then you would have volunteers come in and go, oh my gosh, that dog needs to be put down because they're seeing it from a totally different perspective. And then you and I would have conversations about things and I would ask questions. Okay, well, what's happening with this? What signs are you seeing? So what are your criteria for, and it may not, I mean, nothing is ever set in stone and it's going to be different for every animal, but what are general guidelines for, okay, time to act. Um, and then one of the things that you also had to do, and I, re I remember we were searching for websites and books on the natural dying process and what to expect and having to learn that, um, which is educational for all of us. Uh, but, but what are your guidelines for when we need to have, and, I, and let me just say that Michelle, I don't think you've, I can only remember one that we did in the office, but, and that was because we didn't really have a choice on that one. Um, but all of your kids have been put down or died naturally at Monkey's House, is that correct? Very important to me, unless something happens that I can't conceive, that I can't, and I can't keep them comfortable till the vet gets here. This is their last home. I want them, I want them leaving from here. They've, for whatever reason, been let down at an important time in their life. And they're monkey's house dogs. This is their home. And wouldn't we all want to leave sitting with our best friend, having, <laughs> having someone's finger in our ear? Um, I remember one of our dogs. Um, so, you know, you know, we use food therapy. We take it very seriously here. And um, little Madge had memory masses that spread to her lungs and it was time and that was coming out. And one of the volunteers, Terry, brought out these cupcakes and it was this much cake and this much icing. So I go to give it to Madge and she's like, whoa, hold out, I'm not dying. <laughs> it, took her, it took her two hours. It took her two hours to eat the cupcake. Um, then it was okay. Um, but it's very important to me that they leave from here. It's, 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 it's critically important. Aside from that, if they have seizures that, that we can't break, you know, if, if they have seizures, we'll give them medication, we'll give them extra medication, we'll dim the lights, shut off the, shut off the lights, shut off any stimulation, um, do everything we can, put them on cooling blankets. But if we can't control the seizures, that's a reason that we would put them down if they have breathing problems that are getting worse and we can't get them to settle, we'll put them down. And as strange as this sounds, if they have pain that we can't control, which happens sometimes, then we'll put them down. So, Particularly with but, cancers. Yeah, yeah. So those, so that's our, so that's our, our guidelines. I can also say, um, I thought that natural death was something that just happened. You woke up and your dog was dead. I thought that that's what natural death was. And I think you had come from the HVMA when you're in, you were talking to me about it. And I kind of got panicky. I, I kind of thought it meant doing nothing. I can tell you that natural death is a hell of a lot of work. Um, it's monitoring them constantly, making sure they aren't in pain, giving them mouth care, giving them eye drops, turning them, keeping them clean, bathing them. Um, putting them in the sunlight and following the sun in the different windows as the sun comes through, um, talking to them. It's, it's, it's a lot of work. Um, our first dog that ever died a conscious, you know, where we worked consciously to give her a natural death 
was Molly, a little cocker spaniel that I think you remember bit Jeff a couple of times. Yes. <laughs> and she died the night after the super moon and I think it was October or November. And it had been raining and it was fall and the, it was bitter out and the leaves were all brown. And I guess I would have wanted something spectacular like a, a meteor shower or something spectacular for her. But I, I was out there, she, she wanted to go to the bathroom and I was trying to hold her up. And I was looking at the leaves and they were all different colors brown. They weren't just dead leaves. They were, they were just, just an array of beautiful orange and brown leaves everywhere. And, and the rain was actually like a pitter patter. It was, it was beautiful. It was a beauty that I would not have seen had I not been out there holding her up in all this. Um, it, was, it was hard work, but um, it was the right thing to do. And I was glad that we could do that. We, I would say, not quite half of them here have passed naturally on their own. The other half are euthanized by veterinarians that come out to the house. If we can get them to pass on their own, if things are looking, if they look comfortable, that's, that's what we do. And yeah. we had one um, about six weeks ago, Randy, who had a horrible, horrible heart event. And um, one that I was very familiar with, his heart rate was crazy. His respirations were crazy. I had him on oxygen, had him up in bed, just trying to be calm. And all of a sudden he got up and he was very irritable and anxious. And that's, that's when I took him to the vet. And um, she said, she thinks we're looking at a brain tumor. And to me, it, it came out of the blue. Then he settled and he had this blank stare and he's a 20 pound dog. I didn't feel he was in pain, but I didn't feel he had any quality of life. And I'm very big about us bringing quality to him. So I thought, well, I'll just feed him and keep him clean and keep an eye on him for a few days and just see where we go. And I took him, I took him for laser therapy to help him with pain and everything. And he has made a complete 100% return to baseline down to where if he sees a leash, he's jumping on you and running for the door. And he's, it's not even like an ugly run, it's a, it's a good run and it's crazy. Now I realize the tumor may shift again and we may lose this quality. But wow, and you know, I would like to say, oh, well, you know, I fed him, I fed him this and that and this happened. I just didn't put him down. And, but only, only because I could keep him clean and I could keep him comfortable and I could keep an eye on him. If he was a 70 pound dog, I, I could not have done that and I would have put him down. Yeah. Well, you've had a lot of dogs that uh, will, you know, was it Bugsy? Was that the one that we lost recently that did Bugsy. the up and down? So, you know, Bugsy, we thought was dying probably 10 times. And yeah. then Bugsy would miraculously bounce back and be perfectly. And Michelle would send me videos. Like I'd see this dog and I'm like, oh my God, he's like comatose. He looks terrible. His skin is broken. I mean, he's having some sort of autoimmune disaster. And a week later, I'd get a video from Michelle of this dog racing across the yard with his skin not red and crazy. And having stolen, he was a very <laughs> agile dog. And he actually, one night, he, he stole Holly's sandwich. Like, like she was like, she like was like on the back swing of a walk and he like took her sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> you can't scold him. We were so excited that he did it. Um, but... Yeah, his, he, he was having just huge problems with his immune system and he was so allergic and his skin was so bad and he was put on prednisone for the skin issues, which made his old Demodex pop up to the point where the Demodex made him crazy. Uh, he's probably the only dog I've ever done where I do a skin scraping. It's like, oh, look, 4,000 mites in the, <laughs> on the first slide. Um, but, you know... It, he, he walked a fine line between needing to be immunosuppressed and needing to get his immune system act back together. Um, so interesting case. And we've, we've learned a lot from these dogs. And uh, frankly, it's because of the monkey's house dogs that I finally talked myself into doing my dog Shana's teeth after the cardiologist kept saying, no, 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 no. He finally said, yeah, I think you're, you've got her stable enough to do it. Um, but I had already made up my mind, no matter what he said, I was going to do it because every monkey's house dog that comes in has just teeth rotting out of their head. And that really is painful. It's a source of infection for the kidneys, for the heart, for the rest of the body. It's a source of inflammation. 
makes their food taste bad. It's painful when they eat. And so we kind of decided right at the beginning, look, these dogs are all going to have dental care. And um, we took dogs with pulmonary hypertension, cancer, uh, lungs full of tumors, uh, cardiac mitral valve disease, dilated cardiomyopathy, you name it. And we put them under anesthesia to do their teeth. And um, I'll knock on wood, but we did not lose any of them under anesthesia for a dental. And they came out so much better for it. Oh. And it's funny, things that you wouldn't think are related or could improve, everything improves after a dental. Stuff, the way they walk improves after a dental. And that makes, it, you know, it's just, it's crazy. It's something yep. that's so worth it. It is so, so worth it and so overlooked, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, so a lot of people say, oh my gosh, I could never work in hospice care. Hospice care would be so sad. Like I could never volunteer at a place like that because I would just have to cry all the time knowing that all these dogs are dying. What's your answer to that? We're all dying. Monkey's House, <laughs> Monkey's House is about 90% the happiest place on earth because we do crazy things. I think that's so trademarked. Is it? I think yeah. happiest place on earth is trademarked by someone else. <laughs> All right. Well, happy, well, 90%. We're, we're, we're owning 10% where you feel kind of cut to the gut, but, but you also feel like you did your job well. You did your job well. And, you know, every day we spend in service to making sure their day is the best it can be under the under the capacity in which their body can have a good day. We have, we have a dog that has just two legs that work and we put her in a cart and you can't catch her. Um, you know. <laughs> I saw a video of her running in her cart. You can't tell she yes. only has two legs. <laughs> yes, yes. We have, you know, we, have, we have dogs that are blind and deaf. You have to definitely change things around, do an awful lot with um, scent work um, and, and making, making your own fun. You have to be creative at making your own fun. But, but they're game. They're a hundred percent game. And it's, there's, when, when I say we're all dying, some people die very quickly in, in an hour's time. Some people are actively dying over the course of a week, but the rest of the time, no matter how many diagnoses you have, you're still living and you need to live. You might need to mourn. You might need to say goodbye to somebody. You might need to make arrangements or give away some things but make sure you're living in all that time too, because don't, don't waste that time. And that's what goes on here. You know, yes, they have a lot of things wrong with them, but if you look at them, they have let go of their past, whoever wronged them, they've forgiven them. You know, they're just, they're just ready to go have fun. And, and, you know, I remember when, I think you didn't realize how serious I was about this. And I would make an appointment <laughs> for four or five dogs to come in for an appointment. And I would show up with 10 and you'd say, okay, so why is everyone else here? for a fun car ride and like they'd shake Carly down for treats. I mean, you know, but what a great way to make it that yay, we're going here and oh yay, we're at our vet's office in case something has hit the fan and I need a quick chest x-ray or in case, you know I mean? It, it, it gives great comfort to know that it's like, hey, look where we're going. Um, it's just, I think I shook everybody up every time I came in. Well, we always tried to schedule you sort of when we wouldn't have a million other people because we knew that our waiting room was small and the pack <laughs> that you would bring would fill it up and they would take every seat and, you know, uh, but, you know, half the time they just ran around the building and you're right, they just snagged treats from anyone who was- They trick-or-treated, yes. yeah. They did, they did. Uh, but it, it does make a huge difference. If you have a pet who is afraid to go to the veterinary office, this is something that I- did for many years, uh, once I owned my own practice, I would say to people, look, your pet is scared to death to come here. And every time they come, we are poking, prodding, jabbing, doing painful things. Why don't you just put it in your schedule once or twice a week, put your pet in the car, come on over, sit in the waiting room, have people feed them treats, pet them, and then they get to leave nothing bad happens. And, uh, you know, maybe you need to give them a little rescue remedy or a little uh, mellow out or, you know, some anxiety drops or something for each of those trips at the beginning. But if you can make those trips fun and not painful, they will be much more willing and much happier about having to go in. <laughs> also, under, under that same thought, you know, when they're acutely ill and you're trying to decide if something is, is, going to cause you to lose them soon. If it's not going to stress them out for you to go there and, and for you to listen to their lungs or take an x-ray and say, 
you know, this is looking more like heart failure than pneumonia, or this is looking more like pneumonia than heart failure. Sometimes everything's going to be all right. And it's just a tweaking of the meds. Um, or sometimes you have the peace of mind of knowing that your vet who's cared for the dog for a very long time is saying, yeah, this is bad, but you can do it without stressing them out. It's just one more thing they get to do. Um, Absolutely. So important. Uh, something else that you have incorporated in your hospice care for your dogs, it's, it's not just about, you know, getting their medical stuff right. Uh, there's a lot more that goes into it food therapy. We'll talk a little more about that. Uh, but food, we, as we've learned in just about every lecture this weekend, the gut and the gut health are so important. And a lot of these dogs have a lot of these long-term chronic medical problems because they weren't being fed appropriate diets that were making them healthier. Uh, but you also are very, very concerned about the mental health of these dogs. And that includes uh, field trips and um, all kinds of different things. What are some of the things that you do for the mental health of these dogs? Well, sniffing. <laughs> we sniff, whether it's a different part of the yard, um, whether it's um, deer poop, whether it's going to your office and smelling around the dumpster where every dog who's been there has peed. <laughs> Um, it's, it's a chance. It's like mental stimulation for them, like, like reading a book for us. So we have bully sticks. Um, they, the dogs live loose in the house, but they're crated for meals. And sometimes we have cocktails in the crates, which is a fish skin. Um, it's just something where no one's going to bother them. No one's going to steal it from them. And they can just enjoy chewing it for a long time, smelling it, rubbing their eyes in it. Um, you know, not, not always ideal, but um, so I, I do a lot of stuff that will um, incorporate other senses because so many are blind and deaf. Uh, Violet still loves to walk. She loves to walk fast. Jeff takes her out for a good mile or two twice a day. Um, she goes out with carbon. She loves to, she loves to go in the woods. Um, and the rest of the time she likes to lay out in the sun. So she's got a yard, she's got toys. Um, but I kind of take each dog on their own and find out what it is that they like. Uh, recently, we went on vacation for just a few days to one of our volunteers has a home down the shore and it's a dog friendly home. And I took Tequila and Lucy and Ariel with me. Now, Tequila, he's, he, both his eyes are removed. He's, he's deaf. He has heart issues. He had a blast. You, know, you, think <laughs> you don't want to change things. You don't want to move your furniture. We were at a completely different house and he had a blast. But I was careful to bring beds from home that weren't freshly washed, but, didn't, but weren't dirty. Um, and he laid in them like he knew like to lay here or to lay here. Uh, by the second day, Lucy, our beagle, who's pretty high functioning, she can see and sometimes she can hear, she knew which driveway to turn in, which was ours. Um, and Ariel didn't miss, she, she had her cart on the beach, on the bay, she, she was just going. Um, but we, we make fun wherever we can and, you know, put them for car rides, whatever, whatever will be fun for them, we do including trips to the beach, trips to the forest. Um, and how many, when you take, when you do those weekend trips, how many dogs do you take? All of them. The only one we may leave behind is Violet because she's not good with other dogs. She gets very reactive and I just don't feel like that's, that cortisol. Is that the is same her. Violet that had the nose tumor? Yeah, that she had the she's still hanging in there. And, and she just had this debulked and neoplasied again. She's still hanging yeah. in there. Amazing dog. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. But she just, she loves to go. But yeah, so, so we do the, we do the beach trips. We go to see Santa. Um, we do hikes in the woods and generally it's every dog because I don't want to leave anyone behind. And, and all of our volunteers, they're, they're critical to this. And, you know, there's no one that comes and says, I only walk dogs. If they get a wagon handle, they're pulling somebody. If they get a backpack, they're carrying somebody. Um, some people push one in a stroller and walk three. Um, we, and then we carry extra slings with us in case somebody can't walk, you know, or we plan not to go that far. But the volunteers are great at accepting the dogs with their limitations and supporting them in what they can do rather than saying they can't. Very often, sometimes dogs are just in the wagon, but they get to see different things. They get to smell different things. They get to be in the environment that's excitement. And when we have a field trip, it's, it's like 
it makes me feel like when I was a little kid and I could see the presents under the tree that Santa bought, but my parents were still asleep. Like you're all excited, but you can't make any noise kind of a thing. It, that, that excitement is here and they get to experience that. And then they get to go smell different things. So. Absolutely. So important for them. Um, and I think, uh, a lot of times when people have an animal that's got a uh, life ending diagnosis, it, it can paralyze us into one of two things. It can paralyze, it paralyze us into the fear of doing nothing other than just crying and being upset and, and, and really not supporting the animal. It can also paralyze us into the fear of not doing enough. So uh, the poor animal gets drugged to 20 different specialty centers, uh, hoping that someone will have um, light at the end of the tunnel or a different answer. And um, yes, we, we absolutely, I, I think there's a middle ground where we need to have the advice of professionals, but we cannot leave out the importance of the emotional state of the animal. And I think that that is one of the things behind so much of the success of Monkey's House is that the uh, mental status of those dogs is uh, one of your most important uh, uh, foci. I think that that's something that you work very hard at for these dogs. And, you know, when I was a nurse, they would say, don't look at the labs, look at the patient. Don't look at the monitor, look at the patient. And our own dog, Harvey, he's a little beagle, 11 year old beagle. He was in for a routine physical and one thing led to another. And somehow we mistakenly found out he had hemangiosarcoma. So I, we took out, you did, I think you came back from vacation and took out his spleen the next day because I didn't want to lose him to a ruptured spleen. Um, we talked about going to an oncologist. We talked about looking into other things, but Harvey, we had adopted him late in life. He was terrified of noises, of people. He was just afraid of everything. So I said, no, we're not doing that. You know, I, and, and we managed it from home with your traditional anti-cancer therapies. Um, and for nine months, he lived well enough that I almost could believe that he didn't, that he wasn't sick. And then one day he was. And um, that day I showed up at your office with Harvey and two other dogs, um, Lady G and Fifi. And <laughs> you said, why are they here? And I said, they're my emotional support dogs. I know this isn't gonna be good. Um, and it wasn't good, uh, but it was right for Harvey. You know, it was when they're timid and they're afraid, it's not the right move. Um, keeping things upbeat and happy is what we needed to do, so. So let's talk about um, food therapy. What would you like to know? <laughs> All right, so I, I did a video at Monkey's House a few years ago during mealtime. Uh, explain your mealtime process because it's one of the best things I've ever seen. So we have a counter that's dedicated just to the dogs and we have a spot where their name is and it says what kind of bowl they get because they have different needs. They have different sized faces, different sized noses. Some of them are blind. Um, so they have different needs for bowls. So it'll, so, so their, their names go there and the bowls go there. And then the bowls go there and the bowls also have their name on it. So it's a double check because if somebody gets two scoops of this food, their bowl's over here somewhere, it's precise. So we have the food ready to go in advance, whether it's raw, whether it's gently cooked, it's all prepped in advance. So then we just, sling ash, so to speak. Um, some dogs can handle supplements in there. Some can't, some handle meds in it, some can't. Um, some dogs, uh, we have to like, smear the food in and kind of drag it out to keep them busy. It's, we have a few dogs that are dieting right now and working for the food <laughs> makes them think that they're getting a little extra. Um, and then um, the dogs are in different spots, different crates, different areas where they can eat securely and don't have to worry about someone getting into a, an 80 pound dog's heart medicine. Um, but it, when the volunteers tell you, I, I can't talk during this time, like it takes all of my focus, all of my thinking, um, but it's, it's one of the most important things we do here. Uh, the food, first off, food therapy has empowered me 
to not have to sit and wait until the Lasix kicks in. I can quick, I can get, I can get radishes. I can, I can get, I can get things that can help make a difference right now. And that may support traditional medications. Um, and it works. It, it, it makes such a difference. Sometimes we can use a much lower dose of medication so that as they get worse, we can up their meds. And I, I think that that has such an impact on the longevity that they have here. And while we, as a human, I'm, as a human, I want longevity. As a founder of a hospice that's trying to help as many dogs as I can, I'm, I'm going to say longevity isn't the goal. Quality is the goal. But I want, I want both. I, I want both. And I really feel that it makes a big difference. It's time consuming to, to do this for this many dogs. It's a good two hours twice a day, but we consider it a treatment the way we would consider it going to your office for acupuncture, going, you know, going and having water therapy, going, we consider it a treatment and it's an incre incredible treatment and they like it. And uh, I'm going to go out on a limb and say all the dogs at Monkey's House are on human grade food diets. At, at least, it's at least human grade, if not better. <laughs> yes. So uh, for those of you, I don't have the book up here, but the Canine Kitchen Capers book, Michelle is a, is a very funny person. Um, and I asked her to contribute a, res a couple of recipes for the book. And I also asked her to contribute a story. And uh, that book is a bunch of funny stories that were submitted by clients and pet owners who go to great lengths to prepare food for their pets. I mean, Michelle just told you it's hours a day to make these 25 meals, set them out, get all the medications and supplements for each individual dog because no two are the same. So that's 25 different meals twice a day. I can't even imagine. Although at one time we had 13, so it, you know, whatever. Um, but Michelle submitted a story where she said, yeah, I just spent all day making food for the dogs. And my husband, Jeff, got cold cereal with um, spoiled milk <laughs> because that's what we had. Um, and so, you know, I find that people tell me once they learn about food therapy for their pets, very often they say, my dog eats better than I do. Do your dogs still eat better than you? They do. As a matter of fact, my integrative doctor said, eat your dog's food <laughs> <laughs> because they know that that's where you're pouring all of your energy. So uh, let's talk about where dogs go to live. First of all, uh, how did that saying come about and how did that book come about? Um, it came about, we were trying to come up with a, with a slogan. We're, you know, when you say dog hospice, people kind of stop making eye contact and they just think it's got to be so sad and Jeff is very creative and he's got a good marketing mind and he said no it, monkey's house is where dogs go to live so we actually put that on the backs of t-shirts and it became important for us to say to people they don't come here to die they, they do die but this is where they go to live they live well before they leave us Absolutely. So it just made sense that this would be the name that we would use to tell their stories. And uh, we've left out that you actually bought a bus <laughs> for the yes. dogs. Yes. This bus, I'll tell you, it was, it's so great. Well, so when I would take 10 dogs to your office, we were cramped. And sometimes it depended on personality. Sometimes I could really only take eight. Um, this bus is a human bus that's probably 25 or 30 feet long and we've rigged it so that it's got shelves in there and it's got crates but it also is dynamic in that we can put dogs on wagons in there um, dogs that just need to lay down and have a big space we're able to move it around and it has a hydraulic lift so um, we had a 90 pound German Shepherd that had DM and he was down in front and in back and I could take him by myself back and forth um, to the vet's office because I had the lift and I had a wagon um, so it's given us tremendous freedom, but the dogs love it. This is, I was worried because, you know, when you sit on it, it kind of wiggles a lot. It doesn't feel like my car felt. It makes different noises. I was very worried. So we put high value treats in all the crates. And um, now if, if anyone is missing and they're loose, they're at the door to the bus. If the bus <laughs> is parked, 
I, every every time I take the bus out, I park it by the house with the intention of, of cleaning it out and washing it. It always gets cleaned out. It never gets washed. And, <laughs> and, and they'll stand at the they'll they'll stand at the door wanting to get in. They just cannot wait to get back on the bus. And I I can't think of a greater gift than for them to love that so much. And it's again, it's given us the ability to take all of them to the beach, to take all of them to the woods. And, you know, if volunteers are coming along, I'll say, hey, can so-and-so ride with you? Because then they get the extra fun of riding with one person, but they all fit in and it's been a real gift. It's been a real gift for us. Absolutely. Uh, so tell us a little bit more about the book. If uh, Jeff, your husband wrote the book, Yes. How long, how long did it take him to do that? And, and what was his inspiration? Was it just the dogs? He just said, this is so cool. I got to tell people about it. He's been working on it for about two years. Um, everyone on Facebook, everyone on Facebook made him do it. They talked him into it. You know, we post every night. People, people say, oh, you have a hospice. And we say, yes. And they'll say, oh, I don't know how you do it. And they don't want to, they don't want to hear. And and for those that want to listen, we want to say, because this doesn't have to be a secret. I want, I want people to love and enjoy their dogs alive for as long as they possibly can and have no regrets when they leave. You're sad, but there doesn't have to be regrets. So, you know, we do these posts every single night and people would say, you need to just put this in a book. You need to just put this in a book. So Jeff started copying some of the posts and then putting in some text in between. And before we knew it, two years later, just like that. Just like that. <laughs> just just like that. 10 hours a day after an eight hour work day, just like that. <laughs> so, and uh, if people uh, want to buy Where Dogs Go to Live, the book, which I was one of the, uh, the, the readers uh, during the process of, of getting it to the to the finishing line uh it's excellent it is um it's not sad uh you might cry you know when a dog does pass but there's a lot of stories about these dogs living life to its fullest uh so where is it available it's available everywhere local bookstores can get it um amazon uh any, anywhere you would order a book it's available for sale also i think you could order it there's a link on our website that'll link you to it. And what's your website? It's www.monkeyshouse.org. There's no punctuation in there. Yep, monkeyshouse.org. Um, and one of the things you were telling me is on your website is your uh, FAQ page. What kind of things do you talk about on your FAQ page? Well, one of the things I talk about is everyone asks how we got started. And so I have some bullet points on how we got started. There's I think everything has to work for everybody. You have to, you know, this was, this was a long process, a long journey for me. Um, and there was a lot of things that I needed to be able to have answers to before we started. Uh, we're fortunate to live on a little farm in the middle of nowhere. We don't have any close neighbors. We don't have a school bus stopping right in front of our house. Nothing that's gonna stress the dogs out. Um, we have a township that went along with this. We have a veterinarian that went along with this. Um, but, but there's a lot of things you have to have figured out for us. One of the biggest things was food therapy, really coming together with food therapy. You know, I had been struggling trying to feed fresh for a while and I met you at a fundraiser for the animal orphanage and it was a three hour class. I think it was $35. And I started implementing the things that you were talking about. And Jeff and I were walking the dogs one night and we had nine of them and they were in our back field. And if you weren't, if you were spying, you might thought they were not well behaved, but they were all old dogs with significant illnesses and they were having a blast and, and it was the food, it was the food. And, and it was like, I, I think we've got this. I think we've got this. Um, and then we lost Monkey and we started to push through. And then I talked to you about it and you said, sure. And then you called me and said, hey, <laughs> two dogs might be coming up from Tennessee tonight. <laughs> Um, and you said, I'm not ready. And I said, oh, I'll keep them for a couple of weeks. You get ready. Yeah. yeah. Couple of weeks, couple of years. It's all relative. Or four, but yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, they were they, one of the best things that ever happened to me. The, those two dogs were awesome. Uh, but they also were one of the best things that happened to Monkey's House in that we had a deadline. Yeah. And I've got a great plaque sitting right in front of me. Uh, a goal without a deadline is just a dream. And you had a dream. 
uh, and we gave you a deadline and suddenly <laughs> dogs started <laughs> raining from the sky. <laughs> yep, 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 yep. No, it, it certainly, everything happened the way it was supposed to, but you know, we struggle with finance, with financing, we still struggle with funding. Um, I, I don't think that there's a magic pill for how to start. It's just that I think part of the struggle is you learning yourself how hard you're willing to fight for it because yes, yes. you really have to be willing to, to fight for it. And the fundraising is a, a, a daily a daily chore. Um, and so there is a way to donate through your website, monkeyshouse.org, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, and ballpark, what's it cost a year to have 25 or so hospice care dogs in your house? Ballpark about one hundred and sixty-five thousand. It's a lot of money, folks. It's a lot of money. Uh, mm -hmm. so that's why the fundraising is so 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 important. Um, and this is a very different kind of hospice than a shelter or uh, something where the animals are living in you know a, a cold building. They are actually in a home on sofas, in chairs, on laps. And when you go to Monkey's house, you'll see IV bags hanging from the curtain rods, uh, stacks of medications, blankets, towels, uh, books, food therapy, uh, notes, lists everywhere, whiteboards everywhere. Uh, but um, it has been amazing for the dogs that have been lucky enough to go there to live. And uh, Michelle and Jeff, I just want to thank both of you for the incredible work that you've done, the incredible example that you have set. And I have said this to Michelle for a long time, and now all of you can help get her to do this. Uh, we need the user's manual, how to do this from the get go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Michelle is a brilliant mind. Uh, people email her all the time. By the way, she's pretty busy taking care of 25 dogs, so she doesn't get to answer everyone, but the volunteers do help out. Uh, Michelle, thank you so much. As always, it's a pleasure speaking with you. You are an incredible advocate for these dogs. Thank you so much. Pleasure speaking with you, and you've been a great teacher to me on this journey. <laughs> <laughs> well, I... Hope to continue to teach and uh, be a partner in the journey because Monkey's House is a, a very special place. And um, frankly, I haven't gotten my copy of the book yet, but Jeff said he had one, so I had, I'm not ordering it. We're <laughs> working on it. We'll get it down to you. We'll get it down to you. <laughs> no rush. I have read the manuscript, so it's, it's okay. <laughs> well, he'll get you one that's autographed. That would be awesome. That would be awesome. So folks, check it out. Uh, send a donation, get a book, uh, learn about hospice care. You won't regret it. Thank you. Bye, Michelle. Bye-bye. <laughs>